Welcome to Ventec FM, a series of podcasts where we focus on various aspects of the coffee and vending world. Sounds fun, right? Alongside the suppliers, customers, and everyone else in between, we'll give you a unique look at what we're about and what's truly important in an ever-changing and surprisingly interesting industry. Today's episode is turning the COVID corner. Our FM company is getting the support they need. Intelligent, informative, insightful, innovative, and independent is IFM. The first and still the best online resource of information about facilities management. This is a big and dynamic industry. It can also be pretty confusing. We're here to help you understand it and prosper in it. Whether you're an in-house practitioner, a service provider, or a newcomer to the whole strange business, with two decades of accessible and searchable archives, no other resource is as comprehensive or as authoritative. Today's guest is IFM's Managing Director, David Emmanuel. He's here to talk about the support or lack of that the facilities management companies get and to see post-COVID what help they actually need to get back on track. Hello, David. Hi, thank you very much. What a fantastic intro. <laughs> thank you. Welcome along. Um, yeah, who's David Emmanuel? Um, who is David Emmanuel? So I'm the founder and the uh, MD of uh, IFM, as you already mentioned. Yeah. It's an online news and information resource. Uh, I'm the proud father of two, uh, two daughters. Um, I'm a liveryman. Uh, I'm the webmaster for the worship company of pattern makers. I'm a court wow. assistant to them as well. Um, I've done my time uh, for uh, on volunteering as well within the industry. Yeah. So uh, I have been a director of the Facilities Management Association board director. I've been a board director of the IFMA UK chapter. And I've also done two terms on the Members' Council for, uh, as was BIFM, now IWFM, yeah. and was also the Treasurer for the Women in FM Special Interest Group for IWFM. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Tell me about IFM. So IFM uh, was developed in the last century. Yeah. Um, and I'm proud of that because we're, we're kind of recognised as being pioneers. Yeah. Uh, my background was publishing. Yeah. And, and I kind of always thought to myself, by the time anyone picks up a magazine, it's out of date, yeah. you know, especially if it's news. Articles, interviews, comments, that doesn't really make much difference. Yeah. A couple of weeks here and there. But a lot of it had news sections and it was really out, out of date. So we wanted to build something that was more immediate. So yeah. in 1999, we created this platform um, that delivered the news to people's desktops on a daily basis. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, 2021 now, 21 years ago, people didn't, not everybody had, I mean, it's hard to believe, but people didn't have desktop internet access. They didn't have yeah. email access uh, on their desk, you know, on the desktop. Of course, everyone now has it on their phone. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember when uh, one of the tech guys was, was messing around with his phone. And I went over to him. I said, oh, Jacob, Jacob, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm testing the site out on my phone. I said, what do you mean you're testing it on your phone? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get it to deliver the, the content on a phone. And I said, really? I mean, you know, back then it was WAP. I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah. that's what the technology was. Yeah. Anyway, he did it. And I said, oh, check him. I said, it's, it's clever, but no one's going to do that. <laughs> well, of course, they eat my words yeah. because, you know, looking at mobile devices, that's how people, you know, and tablets, that's how they primarily access the sites these days. Yeah. So the site was there primarily to do what I thought magazines couldn't, um, yeah. be sustainable. I always thought that printing on paper and chopping down trees wasn't really the solution. Yeah. And also the fact that we had a, a more immediate way of delivering uh, news and information to people. Yeah. So it's a combination of a trade magazine um, and, and really uh, research and resources because we do an awful lot of research and uh, surveys. And, yeah. and we like to create reports and try and keep people updated. What, what are the like, what are the trends that are going on within the sector? Yeah, it's, it is brilliant. It's such a great resource. It's kind of if you need something or you need to find something out, it's it's in there somewhere. <laughs> do you know what? I think the interesting thing is, of course, with magazines, you know, some people do. They have a whole collection of them, and they're out there on their shelves. But you know, if you've read an article, you've read a piece of news, and you want to refer back to it. And you ever find that blooming copy of yeah. that edition that was there? So yeah. that's the, the you know I, I I constantly use the search engine on our own site because yeah. you know memory's going a bit and yeah. I think yeah. oh, I know we wrote something about this. <laughs> now, well, now who was it? Who? What did they say? Um, yeah. And boom, you know you can go back twenty years and yeah. find something that somebody has said. Um, and interestingly, we've just written a piece about the whole sector over a twenty-year period, and we 
done one that was 10 years. And I was looking back at uh, an article that somebody had written, and it was about 20 years ago. And what he said still stood the test of time. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting. You could just pull that up, reread it, and, and it transcended time. Yeah. I mean, what he was saying back then still sounded true today. Yeah. So wow. whilst we have advanced a hell of a lot, there are so many things that are exactly the same. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure we'll come on to a, a few of the issues in, in the yeah. marketplace. That uh, Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, and what changes are FM's companies, FM companies facing now? Well, I was thinking about this and I was thinking, well, it's actually all the R's. Recognition, yeah. respect, recruitment and retention. Um, reward, i.e. the lack of margins, the lack of profitability in some cases. Yeah. Um, and the race to the bottom. Yeah. Um, so commoditization. So all the things beginning with R. They <laughs> they they happened. They were there twenty years ago. Yeah. And I'm not sure we we've, we've actually solved all of them now either. Of course, we've created an awful lot of extra issues on ourselves. Um, yeah. I think that the way that we look at buildings um, and the built environment is 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 very much different. Um, yeah. You know, we used to look at buildings and the FM was about the building. Well, actually, we now really recognise it's actually about the well-being of the occupants of the building, yeah. not just about the bricks and mortar. Yes. Yeah. Of course, FMs are managing, you know, all the HVAC, the plant, the equipment, um, but really we're there to support the occupants. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've got that added um, complexity in terms of our, our workload. And also, I think that where the real shift is happening nowadays is about sustainability. So, of course, FMs Absolutely. are managing waste, energy management, um, the use of plastics, the, the use of products that are harmful. So we've got this whole environmental um, aspect going on. And I think that's kind of summed up nowadays with companies that have to do reports on ESG, yep. environmental sustainability and governance. Yep. And of course, I think this is a big big area for, for FMs. I think we're, you know, we're going to be very much more... Uh, leading the way, um, yeah. advising our clients as to you know the best policies um, yeah. in terms of you know that can be about waste management, it can be about energy usage, it can be about um, using better products and packaging. It can also be about you know the LED lights and so I think to summarise that one of the biggest issues that FM faces is that it's used to try and reduce the bottom line costs. And actually, what FM should really be used for is to improve service quality yeah. and well-being of the building occupants. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we're starting to see that happen now, but historically, that hasn't been the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you think the changes and the restrictions will start to make things better for, for facilities management? I do hope so. Um, I think the whole problem, if you look at facilities management and the workplace, is has the workplace actually changed um, yeah. during the pandemic? So what we've seen from all the research, especially from Leesman, is that the average home is outperforming the average workplace. Um, so people aren't wanting to return back to the office <laughs> yeah. um, because they're happier, um, but not everybody. And, and, this is, and this is, again, it's polarised people. Um, as to whether or not that home is set up for working from a home or not. Yeah. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is that, you know, a lot of organisations thought that they'd have their workers back in their offices by now. Yeah. And, yeah. and they really haven't. Yeah. Um, you know, people are still choosing to stay at home. But I also think that the, one of the things that we always um, forget is it's not just about offices. You know, yeah. FM's involved in hospitals, universities, schools, transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, industrial manufacturing there's such a huge amount uh, of places that fms are working yeah and you know it, it doesn't really matter what the purpose whether it's work rest or play yeah it's still about about the work the well-being of, of, of those occupants using that space yeah yeah absolutely and, and there's, there's even been sites that have pretty much had to carry on anyway during the pandemic there the are hospitals as an example exactly things um, have changed there but they, they still carried on i think the pandemic polarized the whole sector there yeah. were those that did nothing and were yeah. furloughed and those that were working twice as hard yeah um and were burning themselves out yeah 
Um, and of course, FMs were there. You know, they had to run the buildings. Yeah. Um, you can't just leave a building unattended. Yeah. So I know that there are buildings where people have and they've ignored the advice and they're going to return back to find they've got legionnaires or legionnaires uh, in, 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 because they haven't run the water through the pipes. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's basic, simple, simple things like that yeah. um, that can really, you know, affect a building. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's important. It's, do FM companies get the support and help they should or need? I think during the pandemic, um, the government really did help an awful lot of uh, FM companies and their yeah. employees. Yeah. So I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like the furlough scheme. No. Um, and, and that obviously has saved millions of jobs. Yeah, I um, agree. I think that there has been things like VAT deferments. There have been C-bill loans. Um, there has been PAY deferments. All of these things have helped keep organisations um, stay solvent. Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> I asked at the AGM for the uh, IWFM if it wasn't for the 193,000 that they deferred in PAYE, the 76,000 they had in furlough, and the 100,000 pounds they took in a C-bill loan, would they still be solvent? Didn't want to answer that question, and they <laughs> answered it that they were in a position far better than, than, than they could have been. Right. Um, but I think the answer is, without it, they would have been insolvent by now. Yeah. So... Yes, I think the government's really helped out. Has the IWFM really helped them? No, I don't think they did. You know, the opening gambit was that they could have mothballed the organisation and put everybody on furlough and waited for it all to end. Right. Um, I think that's a peculiar way to look at the first response. Yeah. Um, I don't think they did enough prior to the pandemic, let alone enough during the pandemic to yeah. help them, help their membership. And I think that what we've seen with uh, the IWFM, unfortunately, is that their membership and their turnover has fallen quite yeah. drastically. Um, I think they said that the in 2020's accounts, it was down 18% on the year before. Membership has fallen again. I think one of the problems with the Institute is they're not particularly transparent and open. And if you ask them for figures, they start telling you about rolling membership figures for average for the year. So when you ask them, well, what well, actually, what's your membership today? They don't give you a straight answer. They say, well, over the last year, we've had, but at the end of the day, for the last couple of years, they've lost, well, they used to be proudly uh, saying that they had about 17,500. Yeah. Whether they've got 12,000 today, whether they've got less than that, it's quite unclear, but they've dropped an awful lot. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. And I think the reason is because they're offering value. Yeah. So membership starts at £150, um, if you look at their trade magazine, and I've got to say, you know, their trade mag uh, facilitate is superb. Yep. Their editor is superb. Um, but it's gone from being fortnightly, so then it went to monthly, so then it's gone every other month. And what we've now seen is that the IWFM have cut costs and said, well, only professional grade members will receive the magazine. Right. So if you're an associate or an affiliate and you're still paying £150 a year, you're no longer getting the magazine and they're saying, well, you won't get a hard copy magazine, but you can get the digital edition. Right. I think that's a bit mean. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the one core benefit that you receive from the Institute is that magazine. That magazine yeah. So I think it's a bit tough what they're doing there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that once you've, you, you've paid your, your, your joining fee and then you, you pay um, your, your annual membership, you just begin at the beginning of the journey to pay. You don't yeah. get anything else for free. If you want yeah. to attend their conference, they charge you. If you want to attend their uh, awards dinner, they charge you. Yeah. Um, and I think the awards dinner, I think they said that the uh, the premium tables were four grand for a table. Wow. <laughs> um, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think what you'll find is that most of the people that attend the awards dinner, which is next Monday, um, the guests are service providers. They're not in-house practitioners. The in-house practitioner cannot afford to take a seat at the... T at, well, there are seats, but most people take tables. But I don't yeah. think they can afford to go. Um, yeah. They're priced out. So 90% of the people there aren't members of the Institute anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so what what's, what should they be doing to well, help? I think the Institute sort of transformed itself uh, from an Institute to a training provider. 
um, and, and a qualification and, and also an accrediting body. Yeah. And, and I think that there's a bit of a problem with that. Um, so they used to outsource that and have a joint venture with a company called Quadrilect, and that was called BIFM Training. Um, and then they decided to bring that in house and do it themselves directly. There are other training providers out there that are superb, like Xenon. Um, and I think the issue is, you know, if you're devising the accreditation, you shouldn't be doing the actual training. You should focus on the accreditation, not the yeah, actual yeah, training. Yeah. It, it, it's Makes a bit sense. like saying to, saying in a game of football that the uh, the goalkeeper's the referee. <laughs> I just don't think it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think... It should be doing more lobbying. Um, I think it should really be getting out there and encouraging people to come into the industry yeah. um, or the profession. So obviously part of what they're trying to achieve is to professionalize FM. Uh, yeah. One of their missions is to become to get chartered status. Yeah. Well, ever since I've known them, um, which was I think it was 1995, they've been talking about chartership. All right. <laughs> and they've never pursued it. They've always had a watching brief on it. Now they say they've got an active strategy to pursue it. Well, the reason, in my opinion, that is that it was a watching brief is because they never had the resources or the actual possible the chances or the likelihood of actually receiving it. Yeah. I think, first of all, I think there are other trade organisations or chartered organisations that would oppose them to the Privy Council, and the Privy Council yeah. would have to listen to people like RICS. Yeah. I think secondly, they're looking for organisations that are solvent and have a strong financial history. Now, IWFM's not made a profit since 2017. Right. Their reserves are down to something like 70,000. When I was on the Members' Council, they had nearly half a million pounds of reserves for just such problems like COVID. Yeah. You know, unexpected. That's the reason they, they put that money behind them. So yeah. I don't think the Privy Council is going to say, well, you, you're, 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 you're financially secure. I think other people will oppose it. And I think the other problem is, is that only 54% of their members are actually of a professional grade. All right. the rest are associates and affiliates. Okay. Well, if they yeah. want to become chartered, I think they're going to have to have a much higher proportion that have got qualifications. Yeah. So, yes, I think it's important to, 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 to encourage everyone to get qualifications. Um, but I don't think they should be delivering the training to get them. I think yeah. they should let other people do that. I think where their focus should be is encouraging people into the industry. Yeah. I think it's always said, oh, I fell into FM. You know, I was from hospitality or I yeah, was yeah. in cleaning or I was this, that or the other. Um, I want it to be a career of choice. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I want kids to say, oh, well, I don't want to be a train driver or a racing driver. I'd like to be a facilities manager. Um, yeah. That's what we've got to try and convince. So I think we've got to go out to primary schools, secondary schools, possibly too late by the time you've got to university, but why not? Go in there, do the milk rounds. Um, try and get that last opportunity to convince people that actually this is quite an exciting um, profession to be in. Yeah. Um, and that not only are you helping the well-being of the people in the buildings that you're, you're managing, but you're yeah. also helping society and the planet at the same time. Yeah. So I think that message needs to be to be delivered and I think they should be doing it. Um, I think it's very unfortunate that the FMA uh, went into administration some years ago because they truly were the natural voice of FM. Yeah. Um, and I don't think IWFM is, you know, they've always said they're there to represent the practitioner or the, the, the professional in getting qualifications. Uh, and it surprises me that they have so many corporate members that are members. Yeah. Because they get even less value than anybody else. Yeah. Um, but I do think that they're starting to realise that. And I think that part of the, the groups that have been have stopped paying the money are, are the corporates. Because yeah. they do receive very little back from it. Yeah. 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 I also think government um, needs to be lobbied and communicated with. Um, I think that uh, it's changing. I think that they've changed their playbook. Um you know, they, they outsource about £290 million pounds a year um, into the sector. Um, I know that oh. they want to try and encourage a third of that into the SME sector. Yeah. Um, and we'll have to wait and see if, whether that actually happens. Yeah. Um, 
certainly a lot of the big contracts that went out went out to the to the larger service providers in terms of um building the nightingale hospitals for example yeah. um, which i have to say is probably the one time that service providers have actually collaborated and worked together for a common goal yeah um and 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 have done absolutely phenomenal jobs yeah i th- i think covid has really shone a spotlight on, on on the whole sector and industry and i think where people didn't really understand what a facilities manager was I think they're starting to get a better appreciation of that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that we, we we still truly understand it. I think we're still looking very much at health and safety um, yeah. and cleaning and security um, as, as being FM. And I think FM is so much wider than that. Absolutely, yeah. And it, I think there is that, there's that kind of lack of knowledge almost that people don't realize how much facilities management companies actually do and, and agreed what, um, they, what they contribute to our business a very good friend of mine martin pickard who is our conference chair at uh, workplace features um he creates a site called the um the mind map or the fm mind map right and it shows every tentacle that fm is involved with yeah and it's i mean you you, you know you need an a3 plotter to, <laughs> to really plot it. and even then you need a magnifying glass to see every little yeah, thread yeah. and link um you know we're involved in so much of what's going on yeah it's it, it is it is surprising um and yeah the, the, the there is that kind of lack of, of, of knowledge i think generally that, that people don't realize how much fm companies actually contribute and and do within a business kind of thing and um, we do think of all the obvious stuff like security health and safety even catering to a level um how how can they be helped more how can these how can any, how can how can we or how can they help FM companies? So I think the problem is is that, as I said, you know, COVID showed how good we've managed to collaborate, and I don't think that we've managed to do that prior to that. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do believe that there really is a requirement for a trade association, yeah. um, and I think that trade association should be there as a think tank. Yeah. Um, it should be there looking at best practices. And it should work together to help um, all service providers and all FMs, you know, do the best job that they possibly can and, and create excellence. Yeah. And so I kind of think that 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 would be helpful to go to be to be put back in place. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> um, and and obviously, I mean, because from, from my experience, a lot of FM companies they, they pretty much break even. They, they don't. They don't tend to make loads of loads of profit as as as, as a business as a whole. And um, from a support side on that, is 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 that just because it's so tight on the margins in terms of bidding for a tender, going for a contract? Is is that always going to be the case, or do you think that that I can change not. as well? I mean, we, I mentioned it at the beginning the race to the bottom and the commoditization. Yeah. No, FM is primarily a service. Yeah. And I think it's very difficult to try and commoditize a service. I remember. Um, that reverse auctions were a thing. Thank goodness they're not anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we were helping a, we were helping a client, and they were they were bidding for a contract, and and basically the price kept going down and down and down. Yeah. And they kept saying, "No, we want this. We will. We want this contract." And I was looking at them saying, "But at any cost." Yeah. And they said, "Yeah, but it's good. It's a good brand to have on board." Yeah. And basically, but then it, yeah. So they, they've so a lot of FM companies have done it to themselves. Yeah. You know, some of them just need a lot, you know, need to put a lot of meat into the sausage machine to churn it out. Yeah. They've got to keep their staff busy. Um yeah. and I think that actually that's not really the most intelligent way of going forward. No. Um you really need to look at the opportunities, look where you're going to be able to add the most value. Yeah. Um and make the most margin. Yeah, yeah. Because if you can make more margin, you'll be able to put back into that contract things like innovation um, that you just won't if you haven't got the margin to do so. Yeah. So I think it's a win-win-win for everybody. Um, if you actually have slightly higher margins, companies make more profitability and they can sort of reinvest that back in. Yeah. So I think technology is going to be a huge game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. However... <laughs> Who's going to pay for it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got to be paid for, hasn't it? It needs so. to be paid for. So <laughs> why would the service providers pay for it if the client's not willing to pay for it? Yeah. They're not. So there has to be an appreciation that, you know, with efficiencies comes investment. Yeah. And I think that um, 
there needs to be slightly longer term contracts. Yeah. Um, you know, I think three is still the magic number in terms of contract terms. Yeah. And, and it really isn't long enough. Yeah. Um, we need five year and we need five yeah, plus agreed. twos. Yeah. And, and we need rolling contracts. Because yeah. if, if you're working well and you're culturally aligned and, you know, you are helping the people within the organization, why change and risk it yeah. for, for just a little less money? Yeah. It, 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 seems, it seems a very foolish thing to do, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I also think that we've seen a, a space of insourcing as well. And I, and I kind of think that, again, it's all about cost cutting. Yeah. You know, they, they, the fail to be able to um, know what the service is that they require, and then when they're not getting what they want at the cost that they want, they think they can do it better themselves in-house yeah. and, and slice out a bit of management layer. And the answer is they can, but actually they're not going to improve. Yeah. So the quality so, actually goes down. Yeah. And in around five years' time, they're going to look and go, well, actually, where are we compared to the market? Let's have a look. And the market has accelerated beyond them. Yeah. And then they're going to outsource again. Yeah. Um, they would have been better off just working out what it was they wanted as a service requirement yeah. and sticking to that. Yeah. And I think we've got problems with KPIs. You know, they're, they're key performance indicators and people get a whole long list of them. Well, actually, yeah. they should be more succinct. Um, so if you can better identify what it is that you expect of your service provider, they've got a much better chance of actually delivering it for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. It does seem like a vicious circle, doesn't it? You've got, you've, you've got. Obviously, everyone's everyone wants the best price. Everyone wants, but it, but it almost becomes, like I say, the race to the bottom where the, the cheapest one wins, kind of thing. And 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 so many companies just want that business. They want the contract, especially with big big names and big brands they want to be associated with, but then almost r run things at a loss or... A, a, a agreed. It's, it's... Um, and, you know, there are a number of organisations that have done that to their detriment. Yeah. And uh, it, it's not the sensible way forward. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you're almost willing to lose a bit of money on a contract to keep... To, keep to try and attract together. other people yeah. in. And I think yeah. there's also that other thing. We're saying, well, we'll go in at this price and then with some clever variations over the term of the contract, we'll make that money back. <laughs> yeah. But don't always no it doesn't yeah. um and therefore you know if you can't get that variation through and you you know and imagine going to a client saying well you know we've just won the tender brilliant we've mobilized oh you want us to do that hmm. oh, i'm afraid that's extra yeah it doesn't create the best will does it no it doesn't and then and then it impacts the the contract renewal at a later date if you've if you've provided a really good service at a really good price then you've got a better chance of keeping that contract or getting rolling or extended contracts if we're doing five plus twos and things like that. But obviously you can't do that if you're promising stuff at the beginning and then having to tweak it and change no, it as you exactly. go along. And it's, but it, it, it is, like I say, it's, it is a vicious circle, I think, for a lot of the FM companies where they, they get in that trap where they just win the business and want to keep the business and then just go around in circles. It's almost. very interesting. So, we, so, so a good friend of mine, Mike Kent, he's always, he's, he's spoken at our conference a few times and, and, and I think his overall message, I and mean, he's won, um, I can't believe that the PNFM Awards, you know, he's won the highest accolade of, uh, of, of being an FM that's, the, that's done the most for the industry. Yeah. And he's always said, you know, FM's not rocket science. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Yeah. He said, yeah, it's not that complicated. Um, why are we trying to overcomplicate things? Yeah. So if we try and keep things a little bit more simple, I think we might yeah. stand a better chance. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, and, and and that simplicity does help. It, I think the, the the key, I suppose, is almost the the expectations of the client need to almost shift a little bit to 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 expect realistic price and realistic kind of levels. And yeah, and I I I think you know there, there was once this um, terminology of the intelligent client, um, and I think that kind of uh, upset an awful lot of other people that were perceived as. The non-intelligent clients. <laughs> yeah. But I think basically what they were trying to say was, you know, if you know what your organization needs and you can articulate that to us, we've got a much better chance of being able to deliver that to you. Yeah. And we've got a better chance of being able to demonstrate that and report that. And, and I think half the problem um, that organizations have had hasn't been the cultural misalignment between them. It's been about the reporting. It's been that the FMs have done the job, but the perception is, is that they haven't. Yeah. And I think that that's where technology can help, is demonstrate where tasks have been done on time, 
how often and what things are still out outstanding. And no one wants to see, you know, pages and pages. What they want to see are the exceptions yeah. where things haven't quite gone to plan. And actually, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, I think technology in so many different ways it is going to sort of uh, revolutionise uh, what's going on in FM. Yeah. But only if we actually uh, give it a chance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I still hear of organisations that, you know, I, I once said to a, to a, a, to a CAFM uh, provider, I said, is your new business coming from your competitors? Or is it people that haven't actually used CAFM systems? You know, yeah. and they're still on spreadsheets. Yeah. And they said, spreadsheets? You've got people that are doing it on paper. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. Yeah. You know, forget artificial intelligence, you know, and, and, and systems that, that are going to sort of, you know, identify problems before they've, they, they, they've even sort of identified themselves. Yeah. You know, you've still got people doing things on paper. Yeah. and on spreadsheets and, yeah. and, and aren't using uh, the technology to its full advantage. So yeah. in some ways, we've still got quite a long way to go. Yeah, we we see the exact same thing in the vending industry. So in, in, the, in the vending world, we you have telemetry, and which is kind of the way that vending machines can communicate back to us. But then there's, comp there's some of our competitors, other companies that, that they literally use pen and paper to go and count what's in a vending machine and then fill it up kind of manually in the old fashioned way. How many paper cups are left? How many beans are left? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, absolutely. that machine can actually not only tell you where you are on your supplies, yeah. but actually the sensors tell you when it's going to break before it's broken. Absolutely. I mean, that's the clever. That's the really clever stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's an investment in technology that does cost, but the amount of money it saves you long term, and it's kind of getting people's mindsets to to shift a little bit and realise that actually this technology, in a lot of cases, you invest in it, and it, it long term it saves you so much more money because it's everything's so much more efficient, so much faster. Um, but it's it's getting the, the pen also, and papers and, to and I think move the, the, technology. Know, the, 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 there are now robotic or uh, cobots, which are not just robots, but they they work with humans. And yeah. I think the the, the the intrinsic difference is is that what they're doing is they're cleaning areas that are very mundane and very routine and, and allowing cleaners it's not replacing cleaners it's yeah. in addition to cleaners yeah, supporting them it's supporting yeah. them so you're taking away the, the the mundane tasks and allowing cleaners to to clean the touch points that need to be cleaned more regularly especially yeah. during covid yeah, you yeah. Know, anything that someone's touching needs to be cleaned far more, more effectively and efficiently and more frequently um yeah. and i think that also we've got a we've got a couple of problems um you know we were talking earlier about what, what are the problems and i think um brexit um, and COVID have, have been major problems for the sector. Yeah. You know, people have left because of those two things and gone back to uh, Eastern Europe and yeah. haven't returned. Yeah. Um, and I think we're failing to, to get frontline staff. Yeah. Um, people don't want to come back and, and work here anymore. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to use more robots. Um, in fact, I've recently been invited down to see Ocado. Um, and not only are their robots picking groceries, they're yeah. also making food for the staff oh wow um i mean quite quite phenomenal yeah wow it's a crazy but world you've isn't got it to have the, but you've got to have the scale yeah to be able to utilize that and make that worthwhile to yeah. create that investment i yeah. mean however cool it is to see it's got to it's got to got to create a return yeah. on investment yeah and it shouldn't be there at the expense of human beings no it should be there to free up human beings to do other things and i think that's i think that's the fear of digitization and uh, and robotics is that it's taking jobs away yeah um but actually i'm not sure that it will i'm sure it will just free people up to do different jobs yes yeah. yeah i agree and, and it, i suppose that moving forward kind of FM companies could it it probably feels like a bit of a minefield to some of them. Like, what do we do first? What do we fix? Where do we go now? How can how can they move forward now in in in, in this post COVID world? I think they all need to to, to differentiate themselves. Yeah. Um, FM, as we said, it's a huge space. Yeah. Um, don't compete after everything. Cherry pick organisations and tenders that you think that you're going to excel at. Yeah. And do so and make yourself a little bit more niche in certain respects yeah um not so niche that one thing happens and you, you can tumble you, you need to spread the risk yeah but i do think that you need to sort of you know have areas of specialism 
that you can yeah. you know, that you can quite easily demonstrate to people and that they will immediately turn to you because that's where your your core competencies are yeah yeah brilliant well thank you david <laughs> thank you um, so so much has changed in the last couple of years and the fn industry has had so much to contend with um, it's time to move forward and get the, this vital part of the industry back on track and um, thanks for your time it's, it's it is really good getting some input from the experts so thank you absolute pleasure this podcast has been brought to you by refreshment systems limited edited by isaac donyo and evan church produced by steve may host jamie cochran with special thanks to our guest david emmanuel and ifm